We'll just pick it up from where we were yesterday with a little bit of uh, revision just to get ourselves into the line of thought as to where we were up to. That is, we're talking about the living Word of God that uh, keeps pulsing all the time. But this living Word of God is the gospel which explodes, explodes all across the whole world because it is God's word that grows and speeds on, as he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. And so with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, everything changed. For the gospel world went out, the world changed. But it's the, this spread of the gospel throughout the world of repentance and forgiveness to all nations that Jesus speaks of at, uh, in Luke 24. The gospel itself doesn't change. It never changes. But as it is continually proclaimed and declared, it changes everything. And you'll notice there that as it grows, now go back one, shall we, in the, uh, in the thing. As it grows out, out there, there's no actual point at which you define it. That is, the definition of the gospel is not by its edges, because it changes everything. And so it just spreads across everything in life and across all the world. Then we move to the next one, and it actually does this to us as well. That is, the gospel is spoken, and around the gospel, and in the gospel, is truth. And the truths of the gospel just are logical consequences of the gospel. So that you can't say, well, this is where the gospel ends and the truths start, because the truths actually come out of the gospel. And you can't say, well, this is where the truths end and the behaviour starts because the behaviour comes out of the truths of the gospel. So in your life, the gospel just spreads across every part of your life so that you become a gospel person, an evangelical, somebody whose whole life is, is embraced by the gospel because the gospel is living and active. It embraces you. It takes hold of you. You live under the sovereignty of the gospel controlling your life, but it doesn't control a little bit of you. It controls every bit of you. So the way you work, the way you live with your neighbour, the conversations you have with people, the fact that you took a day off and came down here, the fact that we're here today. Here's a, what day of the week is it? Saturday? Here's a Saturday when we've got our free time to do whatever we want. And what are we doing? Sitting down, listening to William tell us about 1 Timothy. This is, the, you're weird. <laughs> right? You face the weirdness of the activity that you're engaged in, that that here you are spending your money being, t being taught the Bible on your own free time. You see, the gospel controls everything about life, the whole of life. And so an evangelical is someone who is wholly embraces the gospel that has wholly embraced them. The key to the whole thing is this gospel that is what an evangelical is all about. And so... Are there alternatives? Yes, there are, is part of the problem. See, it's all one piece ever expanding to control the, cover the whole world. It's all one piece ever expanding to con cover the whole of your life. But the growth is not in the periphery. It's not in the behaviour. The growth is in the gospel. The dynamic is the gospel. That's the thing that keeps changing you and keeps changing the world. And that's why we keep teaching the gospel. That's why we teach the Bible, because the Bible is the most explicit expression of the gospel. The word of God is the gospel. The word of God is the Lord Jesus. The word of God is the 66 books of the Bible. You want to say, well, which word are you talking about? And I'm saying they're all the word of God. This is the living dynamic that, that changes everything. And so that's why we, week by week, come to church to hear the Word of God once more. And that's where growth will happen for you personally. Uh, growth for you won't happen in the, uh, on the behavioural things. As you say, I, I've got to go and do five steps now to be a better husband. That's not where it grows. It grows by hearing and understanding more fully the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect husband who then will change you to be a better husband. 
It's out of the gospel that all the changes happen in your life. And it's out of the gospel that we will see England converted. It's not out of building classier buildings, having better band music, having there's all kinds of technologies you can have in church life. None of those are actually going to convert England. They're not wrong. They're not bad. They're good things to have. But they're not the they're not what's going to change the very nature of the church and of the nation. I went to this old, old building called St. Uh, Matthias, which had been in disrepair for since the First World War until we got there in the late 70s. And the first thing everyone wanted me to do was fix the building. And the last thing I did was fix the building. The toilet was a totally inadequate toilet. It was a little lean-to built in the 19th century attached to the back of the hall. It was something that you wouldn't want to go to unless in desperate need. And obviously the people before you were also. Uh, and the remains of that was there. It was just awful. So everybody was very keen for me to, to fix the toilet. I kept pointing out that just across the road was one of the biggest parks in Sydney and there were lots of trees and the rest. We didn't really need to improve our toilet system. Actually, there was a public toilet system over there but they were really unhappy. Uh, To fix the toilet was going to cost 15,000 Australian dollars back in those days. And uh, I said, no, I'd rather spend the $15,000 employing another staff worker to evangelise because with perfect toilets, the church was not going to grow. But with a good evangelist, there's a chance the church will grow. So we put on the evangel. We kept putting on. Every time I got another $15,000, I put more staff on. I never bothered putting new toilets in until in the end, my brother in his weakness started a public uh, uh, fund for the toilets. <laughs> and he couldn't, couldn't cope with it any longer. A weak man. Um, well, he's older than me and older men have weaker bladders, don't they? So... He said, when we finally fixed the toilets, we put a big dedication stone up saying that this was uh, officially opened by the right Reverend Dr. Peter Jensen, B-A-M-A-T-H-L, D-Phil, etc., and gave him all his titles and stuck it on. It's a memorial toilet to the man. <laughs> it's a really nice toilet block at St. Matthias in Tenure Park, if ever you go there. But we never got anybody converted in the toilets. <laughs> That's not the way. You see, the church grows out of the gospel, not out of its facilities. Much as it's nice to have good facilities, I do confess. However, while the gospel people are evangelicals, that we will have the gospel at the center of our lives and of the whole world. There are other people who do not have the gospel at the center. And so, but they do have the gospel but it's always off center. And so because they have the gospel, there are many of the gospel truths and many of the gospel behaviors they have, though their behaviors will be beyond what the gospel behaviors would be also. In one sense, we're all off center. In one sense, none of us have the gospel exactly right, which is why we constantly need to hear it and to teach each other and discuss it with each other and and challenge it. I mean, in these couple of days we've been together, there are ideas that you haven't heard before and and that you may agree with or disagree with. I mean, last night's question time. It's what we're working at is trying to get get the gospel central in our lives by understanding it as centre because we're all a little off-centre. I, I liken it to the, the symphony uh, uh, orchestra. You know, they're all fiddling away. There you go. The conductor comes in and then he points to the oboist and the oboist plays A and then everybody tunes their instruments to fit in with the oboist. That, that note he gives, I understand, of course, his is the, the note that carries the furthest rather than because it's the purest A that's around. But, but everybody tunes to that so that we can play together. And so we come to church to hear the gospel, to hear A, so that we can tune our lives again to what it is, because we're all, in a sense, off-centre. But there are some people who, even when you play the note, they won't tune their lives to it, because they like the bit of the gospel they've got, but they don't like every bit of the gospel. And so they actually are building their lives with a semi-gospel, with a part of the gospel, but not actually the gospel. And there's all kinds of differences. There are some people for whom the gospel 
has never been at the centre and they're not attempting to bring the gospel into the centre of either their lives or of the church. That makes it a little confusing as an image to us because when we meet them, we believe the same thing they do about A and B and C, some of D but not really E and they're actually different in F and they contradict G. And you think, well, are they really with us or they're not with us? And the answer is they're not really with us, actually. They can share a lot of Christian truths and behaviour, even some of the gospel truth itself, but they're not, in the end, gospel people. That's not, they're not embracing the gospel. They're not wholly embracing the gospel. There are other centres to their Christian life. Indeed, the overlap can be it actually can be accidental. It can be just behavioural similarity. For there's many like that. They've actually not got the gospel connection at all. But I've coloured them in a little bit red because some of their behaviour is the same as Christian behaviour. That's English, really, isn't it? The idea that you stand in a queue and are polite and wait for each other is a very Christian behaviour. But it's, it's an English behaviour. Well, that's because England has been influenced by the gospel. <coughs> You go to other countries where the gospel hasn't been and no one waits for anybody. It's all push and shove. But the gospel has had its effect on the behaviour of the culture and so you have this cultural Christianity that is not Christian at all, in any sense, really. It just happens to have coincidental behaviour that is Christian behaviour. And there are some, of course, who are just total opponents whose whole life is completely different. They deny that Jesus is the Christ, deny that Jesus' death was for our sins, deny that Jesus rose from the dead, deny that Jesus will return to judge the world, deny the gospel explicitly and completely. And that's just a complete difference. But the confusing ones are the red ones for us, isn't it? Because they, they act Christianly. They're goodly, but not godly. If you hear the important difference that, that William brought out for us in the, in the study just a few moments ago. It leaves the world with, of, of modern religions in a confused state. But let's get it clear about it. The evangelical is the gospel person, the one who embraces the gospel. That is the centre of their very being and affects everything in their lives. That's what the evangelical is. And so... Let's turn, that we just picked up from yesterday and taken our steps to finish off what was yesterday's talk, which I'm now sharing with our friends working the PowerPoint so they know to turn to the next talk as I do the same. As we come to then the third of this uh, series that we're in, I told you at the beginning, it's all just one long talk that I've chopped up in different places. We need to understand then that we've come to the gospel age, which is where your notes now actually pick up on. And if you're outlining, you've filled all this in already, have you? It's page what? 10. Thank you very much, page 10. And come with me to that passage again in Luke 24, which is just such a pit critical, pivotal passage outlining for us the three phases of history. Luke 24. He said, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Everything from the beginning of time all the way up to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ laid out by God, promised by God, prophesied by God, planned by God, purposed by God, all had to happen. So now in my three years, they've happened. The Christ, verse 46, it is written the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And here he is risen from the dead, talking to his disciples. They just saw him killed. They've now seen him standing in front of them. It's happened. The resurrection has started. And so now what is to take place? And that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. There is, there's one, and you're my witnesses for this, and so the Holy Spirit's coming to you in particular to enable you to be the witnesses to all the nations. So here is the, here's the whole of history in its three stages. All leading up to all the preparation, the priest, the altar, the sacrifice, the law, everything there preparing the minds to understand Jesus' death and resurrection. Now the death and resurrection has happened. 
Let me explain to you what it's all about so that you can now take it to the rest of the world. Here is the turning point that is so critical. Notice the response that he's expecting, repentance and uh, repentance and forgiveness of sins. Uh, as I've got older, I still love watching sport, any sport with a ball, but the older I get, the harder it is to follow the ball. Uh, it just seems to go much faster these days. And it's very hard when I'm out like watching cricket, and uh, it's very hard watching cricket as an Australian now, it's just embarrassing. Um, but it's very hard to watch it because the ball is going so fast I miss it. And you think, well, I might as well stay at home and watch it on television. They can at least give me slow mos later so I can see what happened. But I like being out there. However, what I've worked out is the follow through is the key. You watch where the batsman's bat goes towards and look out in that line and that's where you'll see the ball before it hits the fence, hopefully. The follow through is the key indicator of what the batsman intended. If you follow through and it doesn't hit the fence there, there's a good chance he just got caught and slips. Uh, you know, but he intended this particular line. And so follow through is a very important part of any shot. Cricket, tennis, golf, same. Um, uh, I used to play golf with my brother. Uh, I have a profound slice, he has a profound hook. And so we used to meet at the green and walk to the tee and then head off in our different directions <laughs> uh, down the fairways opposite. We never played in our own fairway. We always played against the, tra against the traffic and then joined again at the, the next, uh, the next uh, green and had a little chat to each other. I found a terrific golf course in Sydney called Botany. It's only a little nine hole course, but it's wonderful because it's, it's just one paddock. You go around and you go around in a clockwise fashion which meant every time I sliced, I was in the fairway next to me. And every time he hooked, he was out of bounds. <laughs> and so I beat him all the time and he never understood how I could beat him at botany when I couldn't at other courses. Um, I haven't told him. I hope he doesn't listen to this tape. Well, he doesn't. He's too proud to listen to my tapes, of course. <laughs> so the follow through in golf shot of course is the key thing you've got to learn how to follow through in the direction you actually want to hit rather than slicing across or hooking across the ball the follow through is a key element of understanding why am i talking about this because the gospel what's the follow through of the gospel well, where does it go to where does this message of jesus death and resurrection come from you can learn from the old testament what it means and you can learn from the new testament as to how it follows through where does it go to so as a result of gospel preaching you see what happens is they went out and they founded schools and hospitals and created political unrest and created social justice in the roman empire they developed art and music and ballet and self-help psychology and prosperity was abounding everywhere not None of that was the follow through of the first century gospel preaching. None of it. Jesus didn't ask them to do it. And what's more, they didn't do it. And there was no attempt to do it that you can see. What do you see? Go to Acts chapter 20, verse 20, where Paul talks about his ministry. Acts 20, verse 20, where Paul is talking about his ministry. He's discussing it with the elders of Ephesus uh, when he calls them together to a place called Miletus. And I'm Picking it up, say, verse uh, 20, how he talked about serving and the trials and temptations he had. And he says, verse 20, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me then, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me that in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as of precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God, and now behold, I know that none of those among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. And therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Notice the ways in which he describes the work that he's been doing. He calls it uh, in verse 21 to Jews and to Greeks, because it's the same gospel to everybody, to Jews and to Greeks, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. 
or he talks about it in terms of verse 20, anything that was profitable. Or in verse 25, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Or in verse 25, that was 24, 25, proclaiming the kingdom of God. And in verse 27, the whole counsel of God. No, 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 different things he's doing. They're all the same. If you proclaim the kingdom, you'll be proclaiming the whole counsel of God. If you proclaim the kingdom, you'll be proclaiming the gospel of grace of God. If you proclaim the grace of God, you'll be calling upon people to repent, to receive forgiveness. And so it is repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus, which is the whole counsel of God. Uh, many a young man, when he reads about preaching the whole counsel of God, thinks he's got to start with Genesis 1-1 and finish in Revelation 22 and hope that you tickies doesn't fall asleep and fall out the window en route. You don't have to preach the whole to preach the whole. Right? It's not every, it's all. And what is the all? The all is Jesus Christ is Lord. Repent, believe in the gospel. The kingdom of heaven has come. Repent, believe in the gospel. God is graciously forgiving you through the death of the Lord. I'm not saying anything different. I'm just saying the same thing differently. But it's the same truth that is being explained in its different parts. That is, the proclamation is more than just a fixed set of words. For the gospel has a logic to it. A logic that is expressed in words, but it's a logic. So now I'm going to do a doodle for you on the page that is before us up here. You thought this was here for no good reason, but it's not. It's because I want to show you a very famous gospel presentation that most of you have seen before. And if not, now is the moment that you've seen it. It's called The Bridge to Life. And uh, it describes how humans, you see, uh, are separated from God by sin. That's an end. Never mind, it's an end. Right? Because of sin, how are we going? Look, I can't make it any bigger or clearer for you. Because of sin, God and humans are separated. But humans have tried to reach God, putting out little ladders that would be able to separate, able to bridge over the sin gap between us. And so we, we try good works to get to God, or we try religion to get to God. Uh, and, but none of these ladders, we can never get to God. However, God, in his grace and mercy, sends his son into the world to die on our behalf on the cross. And the cross, you see, is the bridge to God. And so we are able to get to God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a terrific gospel presentation. It's so, so simple. It's so straightforward. Once you've heard it, you're able to share it. Even For those of you who have never seen it before, if you had an opportunity to share the gospel with someone at work next Monday, you could draw that. You could do that. It is so simple. It is so straightforward to have it like that, isn't it? It's just wrong. That's all. It's a small detail, but it's wrong. Well, how can it be wrong? It's got God, it's got sin, it's got faith, it's got the cross, it's got Christ. What's wrong with it? The whole logic's wrong. Okay, you tell me what's wrong with it. Quickly, I've got a long talk today, I'm going very fast, don't waste my time in silence. What's wrong with it? We don't try and build the way to God. Sorry? We don't try and build the way to God. No, good works, and uh, we're not trying to build our way to God, we're actually trying to get away from God. That's what these are, right? What else is wrong? Judgment. Sorry? There's no judgment in it, is, it, is there? Right? The separation between God and man is the judgment of God, not the sin. That is, we didn't walk out of the Garden of Eden. God kicked us out of the Garden of Eden because of our sin. So sin is not the separation between us and God. Sin is the cause of God separating us from him. So it got the wrong view of sin. Sin is the fact of religion and good works. That's where the sin bit comes. That is, this man is not seeking God. This man is actually running away from God. Sin is running away from God that has caused the separation. See, the, the logic of sin and of our attempts to reach God all, all back to front. Yeah, what else is wrong? Sorry? There's no resurrection there. Jesus is still on the cross. There's the bridge there, yes? Lordship of Jesus. There's no lordship of Jesus. He's just hanging on the cross. No repentance. no repentance. No. The best we have is faith 
in which we're able to get to God when actually it's all about God getting to us, right? The Holy Spirit changing us. I saw it once at a camp, which really showed me just how dreadful this whole presentation was. It was a youth camp that I was at and uh, speaking, and the bloke gave this presentation of sin and the ladders getting out and all the rest of it. And then he put in the uh, cross of Jesus that uh, would get from us to God uh, and uh, the man, etc. But you see, the little cross didn't get all the way. That's because we've got to have a little ladder called faith. You see? And so with our faith and the Lord's cross, we we're able to get there. Now, I'm not an engineer, but even I could work out <laughs> this wouldn't work. Yeah, I mean, it just logically has a flaw that is fairly <laughs> fundamental to it. But theologically, the flaw is even bigger, isn't it? Because this actually is classic Roman Catholicism and semi-Pelagianism and Arminianism. It's wrong at almost every point. But that just highlighted how bad the normal presentation, because that's an abnormal presentation, how bad the normal presentation that you have is. That is, the gospel is not just propositions, though it is expressed in propositions. You can't do it without words because it's, it's a declaration, it's an announcement, and the propositions are critical, but it's not just, it's the logic. There's a whole logic to what the gospel is, and the logic is necessary. Some years ago, I wrote a pamphlet. Uh, uh, no, I didn't write a pamphlet. Some years ago, I created, wrote a, uh, a training course in how to share the gospel with people called Two Ways to Live. It's, it's actually a catechism, to tell you the truth. It trains people in the gospel. Uh, some of you will have seen it with the uh, very careful artwork that I do, uh, little doodles of humans and crowns and world circles. It's about as much as I can draw badly. Uh, and we, we've taught two ways to live all around the world. What's important about the two ways to live is not that it is brilliant and mine and that kind of thing. What's important about it is it's about the logic. You can't understand sin unless you have a doctrine of God the Creator. And so to start off without a full statement about who God is does not... Now, many of the New Testament gospel preaching, they don't mention much about God the Creator. That's because he's talking to Jews. They already believed that. They didn't need that piece of information. If they did, they would get it. But the couple of times when Paul preaches to non-Jews, Acts chapter 14 in Lystra, Acts chapter 17 in Athens, the first thing he mentions is the Creator. Because <laughs> until you understand the Creator... You do not understand why rebellion against God is, in fact, sin, what it is. And you will not understand, therefore, the rightness of judgment. And until you understand the rightness of judgment, you can't understand the cross. Why do we put people into prison when we put people into prison? You see, until you've got a right understanding of punitive justice, you cannot understand the cross. In the non-Christian atheistic world, we put people into prison for utilitarian reasons. That is, not vengeance, not revenge, but rather to improve society and help. And so we have three reasons for putting people into prison, to prevent them from committing the crime again, to deter other people from committing the crime, and to rehabilitate them so that they won't perform the crime again all of which are looking for a positive outcome in the future and for a care for society and for the person. And it sounds kind and humanitarian and, and it just is totally corrupt and evil because that is why Joseph Stalin put people into Siberia. They had anti-Soviet thoughts and so he put them into Siberia so as to deter other people from anti-Soviet thoughts, to prevent their anti-Soviet thoughts affecting the rest of society, and to give them a few lobotomies while they were out there so they wouldn't have those thoughts anymore. Right? That is, that, that's what it is. Jack. Jack looks like he's going to steal. He has that kind of, that eye, look, the dimples. There's the giveaway, right? <laughs> There is a man who's determined to thieve from us. So what we'll do is we'll take him outside and we'll imprison him. 
we might do it. You know, we'll, we'll do nasty things to it. And that will stop anybody else from trying to steal. Won't because you think, oh boy, he just thought of stealing and look what we did, look what we did to him. Can you imagine what he'd do if he actually did steal? And while he's out there being flogged or whatever it is we might like to do to him, uh, while we imprison him, prevent him from having lunch, that would be enough prison for him. <laughs> while we're doing this kind of imprisoning for, for, for him, you see, we stop him from stealing, don't we? And, and the lobotomy we give him, he won't think of stealing ever again. We've fulfilled all the goals of utilitarian justice. But what's the problem? It's just unjust. It's unfair. It's not right. He hasn't done anything. He just looked like he was doing something. But it fulfilled the requirements of utilitarian justice. That's because utilitarian justice is unjust. The only reason we can actually punish Jack is because Jack has done something wrong. But that is not utilitarian. That is retributive. That is giving somebody what they deserve because of what they have done. Now that is a different system of justice altogether. But it is necessary for us to be able to do anything against anybody. Without that retribution, there is no justice. Now it's very important to understand this, friends, because our world doesn't talk this way anymore. In fact, they poo-poo it. They say, oh, we don't do it for revenge, do we? No, it's not revenge. It's giving people what they deserve. Because there is a right, there is a wrong, and you do the wrong, you deserve to be punished. But if you don't believe there is a right and a wrong, then you don't actually treat people justly, you just pe treat people by social engineering. And social engineering is Adolf Hitler, social engineering is Joseph Stalin, social engineering is Mao Zedong, social engineering is the 20th century genocides and horrors. That's where it comes from because they've lost this sense of retributive justice. But the average person still wants retributive justice. You see them outside the courts, when the families of the children who have been abused or whatever it is, they cry out for justice and they get interviewed as they come out and say he, he deserved a longer prison sentence. The, the community knows justice is required from doing what is wrong and being paid for, punished for it. When you understood justice, then you will understand the cross of Jesus. But if you don't understand justice and retribution, the cross of Jesus makes no sense at all because it doesn't deter anybody, it doesn't rehabilitate anybody, it doesn't any of the things that you're supposed to do. You've got to understand the logic of creation and sin and justice to understand the cross and the resurrection and therefore why repentance. In fact, it's a logic, you see. The gospel has a logic to it that can be expressed in propositions and words. And this logic is circular because truth is circular. The circle of truth, as I call it, the, the truth is circular. The Bible says the Bible's true. That's completely circular, isn't it? But truth must be circular. It always has to be circular. Otherwise, it is answerable to some other truth. You see, take the euthyphro. Uh, Socrates has a discussion with Euthyphro, according to Plato, he writes it up this way, and Euthyphro asks the question, it's a, it's a, it's a dud question, it's a trick question that uh, given. Uh, Euthyphro talks about the gods doing good. He actually used the word pious, but I'll say good, it's an easier system to understand. And Socrates says, do the gods do good because it's good, or is it good because the gods do it? Now, whenever you ask those kinds of questions, they give you one of two alternatives. You know it's a, it's a, it's a salesman's con. Don't fall for it. Right? This is older Socrates. Don't fall for it. Because there's only two alternatives. There's actually several other alternatives. I won't give them to you today because that's not the point of this discussion. The point of this discussion is the danger of worrying about life, be truth being circular. See, do the gods do good because it's good? Because if so there is something to which the gods are answerable, namely goodness. So goodness is more important than God. Or is it good because the gods do it? Well, if that's the case, goodness is just arbitrary. I mean, if the gods choose to commit adultery, then that would be the good. Or if the gods choose to murder little children, then that would be good. 
So there's no goodness. There's just the arbitrary will of gods. Which do you choose, you see? And there's more choices than that, especially if you know the true and living God. But notice the one about, is God answerable to something called good? No, God is good. He's not answerable to the good. That can't be. Truth itself, God himself, must be self-authenticating, must not have something to which he is answerable. Otherwise, that to which he is answerable is greater than God. And there is nothing greater than God. God is truth, Isaiah 65. Je Jesus in John 1, 14, uh, uh, in John, well, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Spirit is called repeatedly the Spirit of truth in John 14, uh, 17, 15, 26, 16. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all truth. But that's, that's circular. Yes, but it's a circle that is dynamic that is living, that is pulsing, the living, active Word of God. The Word of God at work in you who believe. It's the power of God for salvation, this truth. That is why the gospel is so explosive and reaches to the end of the world, because it's not just a passive truth. It's the truth that rules the world. It's the truth that changes and challenges everything. Now, at this point, you should be saying to me, but Philip, how do I ever just get on the truth? I mean, if I read the Quran, the Quran would say the Quran is the truth. I read the Bible, the Bible says the Bible is the truth. Why do you choose the Bible over the Quran? I mean, does that mean if I grow up in a Christian family, I will be, I'll believe the Bible. I grow up in a Muslim family, I'll believe the Quran. But each is equally true. They can't equally be true. So... How do you know which is truth? I mean, how can truth be answerable to something above truth, to know what it is? Well, tomorrow I'll talk to you about that. Those of you who are leaving early, tough. Um, the gospel is about the truth. It's all being recorded. Make sure you listen. The gospel is about the facts and the interpretation. It's God's truthful explanation of the world. It's the word of God that interprets the facts of life to us. Um, take 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that we look at, 1 Corinthians 15 and that wonderful passage where he talks about the gospel. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. See, the fact Jesus died the interpretation for our sins. There's lots of other interpretations. He died because the Jews hated him. He died because Pontius Pilate was a weak-willed man. He died because he was a political revolutionary. There's all kinds of interpretations, but the interpretation of the gospel is he died for our sins. But what does for our sins mean? In accordance with the scriptures. If you want to understand dying for sins, go back to the Old Testament scriptures. The whole sacrificial system was about killing animals, killing, taking life for the sake of sins, to be paying for sins, to turn aside God's wrath. It's all laid out there. That is the fact Christ died, the interpretation for our sins, the basis of that interpretation according to the scriptures. The scriptures are the interpretation of, of the facts. They're God's interpretation of the facts. Uh, Mark chapter 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God. As it is written in the scriptures, or as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, if you want to understand what Jesus, Son of God, Christ means, go back to Isaiah. He then quotes Malachi because Isaiah is the beginning of the prophetic writings. The, the Bible, the gospel, is God's interpretation of the facts. That's why you don't interpret the Bible, or you shouldn't interpret the Bible. I used to write and give courses on how to interpret the Bible. Silly me. Uh, this is one of my progresses that you may see. I don't give those talks anymore because it's wrong. You don't interpret the Bible because the Bible is the interpretation. What you've got to do with an interpretation is read it, understand it, comprehend it, but you don't interpret it. 
Otherwise, I interpret the interpretation and give you my interpretation and you interpret my interpretation and then we go off to discussion groups and we interpret each other's interpretations and in the end, no one knows anything because we've just gone into the solipsisms of interpreting interpretations. Part of the problem that you have is the changing of the meaning of the word interpretation. This was where I came unstuck because I didn't realise the meaning of the word had changed, but it has during my lifetime. Interpretation used to mean comprehension, understanding. Today it means something quite different. That's because in my childhood, we were taught that the author was sovereign over his own works, whereas in your childhood, you've been taught the reader is sovereign over the writer's works that the authorial intent is an irrelevance. What the author meant, that's his problem. How you understand it is what actually matters. That's a load of nonsense and rubbish, uh, but that is how you have been raised. It's not your fault. I just hope to liberate you from this complete idiocy that has come upon modern philosophical thinking as a result of atheism. Uh, if you go to, this is a dictionary definitions I just picked up from my computer. Uh, interpretation, one, an explanation or establishment of the meaning or significance of something. That's the old fashioned meaning, you see. Two, an ascription of a particular meaning or significance to something. That's the new meaning. See the difference between those two? That's how I used to run courses on number one. <laughs> how to understand, how to comprehend what was meant by these words. Whereas today, you read it to find out what you mean by those words that the other person wrote. And so classically you see it, the way in which an artistic work such as a play or piece of music is performed in order to convey a specific understanding of the work. And so I, Helen and I, one time when we were here in England, were taken to a uh, play of Macbeth which was set in uh, Russian Revolution. And the three witches turned out to be nurses in a Russian revolutionary um, uh, um, hospital um, and uh, stirring all, all kinds of troubles, etc. And it, Shakespeare, eat your heart out. You know, I mean, it just had nothing to do with Shakespeare anymore. It had to do with the political leanings of the director of the play trying to make Macbeth into something that Macbeth never was. Now, he's got every right to do that if he wants, but why doesn't he write his own play rather than borrow Shakespeare's? You know, I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a great nonsense. One of the ways of understanding how stupid uh, post-modernity and relativism is, is to question whether you would like to have a post-modern surgeon operate on your body. Most people don't want post-modern surgeons, you know? I mean, it looks like an appendix to me, you mean that's your liver? Oh, well, never mind. That's only your view of a liver. It looked like an appendix. I mean, it's an absurdity, isn't it? We do know the truth and we can tell the truth to each other. And it's not all a matter of interpretation. But yet in our world today, that is how people view. I was having a haircut in, uh, in London a little while ago and I was evangelising the uh, whole f shop because the woman who ran the shop came out and started talking to me in a loud voice and so we shared some evangelistic opportunities and she bowled me a beautiful full toss outside the leg stump asking about the, the meaning of the death of Jesus so I explained at some length on this subject and when I finished she said well that's your interpretation. End of discussion. Right? I mean, what more can you say at that point? You have your interpretation, I have my interpretation, don't bother me, I won't bother you. We do not know what the truth is, we only know what your interpretation is. You see, it's a hopeless defence of weak-minded people, but it's very common. Uh, 2 Peter 1 is not understood by most bonds. Go to 2 Peter 1 for a moment, in verse 16 following 2 Peter 1, because... <laughs> The Bible here uses interpretation in exactly the way the moderns don't understand. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, we did not follow cleverly devised myths. Every time the word myth occurs in the Bible, it's negative. Uh, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received the honour and glory from God the Father, a voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, which is a quote from uh, uh, Isaiah 42. Um, 
We heard ourselves this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word, Isaiah 42, more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in the dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. See, the interpretation is the prophets. It's not your interpretation of the prophet. The prophet is interpreting life. What you've got to do is read the prophet's interpretation. You don't interpret the prophet's interpretation. You read the interpreter. He's the one who gives the interpretation, not you. You just read and understand and comprehend. The key central facts of Jesus is death and resurrection. But what do those facts mean? Jesus died. Jesus rose. What is it about? They establish that he is both Christ and Lord. His death is an atoning propitiating sacrifice. His resurrection is the judgment of the new age commenced where forgiveness of sins is available because of his atoning sacrifice. And so the kingdom has come and therefore repent and be forgiven. All of those are gospel truths. All of those are connected logically with each other, the logic of the whole thing. But we have now come to the resurrection age. I'm going to read now from Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, please. Just four verses that are there. When the gospel starts being preached by the apostles, Acts chapter 4, it's one of the very earliest gospel presentations. Acts 4. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captains of the, of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Did you hear me misread that passage? Because I just misread it. Hands up those who, who picked my misreading. A lot of you here. One person picked me misread. Two, three, me. Those two are from Durham. Where are you from? So, three Durham people <laughs> picked the misreading. Their brains are a bit colder up north. Yes. <laughs> As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple of the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in the custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came about to 5,000. Hands up those who heard me misread at this time. Okay, what did I get wrong? Verse 2. Verse 2. What did I get wrong? Uh, you missed out lots of words that change the meaning. Yes, okay. Which words did I miss out? <laughs> in Jesus, the resurrection. I read it as the resurrection of Jesus which is what you expect to hear. And so you heard me reading it correctly. But the words in front of you says, in Jesus, the resurrection. Do you know why you didn't hear that? Because you don't know what the resurrection means. Excuse me saying so, you may, but you don't. You see, Jesus' prediction was, hard, was never understood. In Mark chapter 8, verse 31, 9, 31, 10, 34, I think it is. Yes, 10, 34. Jesus told the disciples he was going to rise from the dead. Yet none of them ever notices it. You see, Jesus, Peter says, you are the Christ. And Jesus says, yes, and the Son of Man's going to suffer and be uh, beaten up and wrecked by, the, by the, the chief priests and all the rest of it, handed over to the Gentiles and be killed. And on the third day, rise again. And Peter says, no, that won't happen to you. What won't happen to you? Won't rise again? No, Peter didn't hear that, did he? What won't happen to you is you won't be beaten up, you won't be killed, you won't be crucified. But why didn't he say, why didn't he say, notice that three days later Jesus was coming back. Why didn't he say, oh, that'll be fantastic, just a weekend away. Where will we go? Will we go fishing during that weekend? I mean, you're going to come back from the dead. What a miracle. This is fantastic. Do you want us to have a photograph? I mean, there, there are all kinds of questions he could be asking, but he doesn't notice. Why doesn't he notice? Come with me to John chapter 11 and you'll see why. 
John 11. John 11. Jesus turns up late. Lazarus is dead. Martha confronts him. Now, my brothers and sisters, you know the end of the story. So stop thinking of the end of the story. You know what's going to happen. You know that Jesus is going to say to Lazarus, come forth and the man's going to come out of the grave. You know Jesus is going to cry uh, because that's the shortest verse in the Bible. So everyone who's ever learned a memory verse has learned that one. <laughs> Jesus wept. Uh, I've got that ticked off. I can pass the exam now. <laughs> and, and if you're old as me, you know the King James Version has the favourite boys verse in the text because it says, Lord, he stinketh. Uh, um, which is ruled out in the modern translations. Um, Biddy, the uh, King James had wonderful the superfluity of naughtiness. They were wonderful phrases which you've lost now. But forget all that. You don't know what's going to happen. You're with Martha. If you had come in time, my brother would not have died. Um, verse 21. But I know even now, whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. What does she now think? Your brother will rise again. She doesn't think he's going to pop out of the grave, stinketh or not. That's not what she's thinking. Look what she says. I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Huh? What's this? You see, for the Jew of the first century to rise again, to be raised from the dead, to be resurrected, all means go to heaven. Because from the Old Testament, Ezekiel 37, Daniel chapter 12, the end of the world is the resurrection of the dead. So to say someone is going to rise from the dead means in the end of the world of the judgment, they'll go to heaven. So when Jesus says, your brother will rise again, of course he will. He was a good, godly Jewish man. He believed in the Lord God. He trusted even you. Of course he'll rise from the dead. You're not telling me anything, Jesus. But he was, wasn't he? Because <laughs> he says, yeah, I am the resurrection. This is it. This is the judgment. This is the end of the world. This is the beginning of the kingdom of heaven. This is the new age that is coming. This is the resurrection. They preached in Jesus the resurrection. They didn't preach just Jesus rose from the dead. They preached the age of the resurrection, the end of the world, the judgment of the universe has now commenced in Jesus rising from the dead. Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of the end of the world. It's the beginning of the judgment of God. It is the beginning of the forgiveness of sins and the condemnation of the world. We don't understand the logic of the resurrection. I preached the gospel for many years without understanding the logic of the resurrection. Because I would preach about, you know, we're sinful, we deserve judgment, Jesus didn't sin, he doesn't deserve judgment, but he was judged in our place so we can be forgiven, turn and accept him. Oh, and by the way, he rose from the dead. It's kind of a little denouement, tacked on the end kind of thing. But no, no, when they preached the gospel all through the book of Acts, what they preached was the resurrection. They don't mention the death, the atoning death of Jesus. They mention the resurrection because the resurrection is the establishment that his atoning work has worked. The forgiveness of sins is now available. The judgment has now come. The end of the world has arrived. There's nothing left other than the tidying up. So repent. Now's the moment to repent. Now's the moment to get right with God. And what's more, in the death of Jesus, he's pronouncing that forgiveness is available. Here is the moment, you see, that you can have forgiveness. When you go to Acts 2 and the day of Pentecost, which we, we won't do look at, but Acts 2, it's not about speaking in tongues. The speaking in tongues is a fulfilment of the Joel prophecy that at the end of the world, all the nations will hear in their own language of the salvation that is in God's, uh, that's in God's Messiah. And so that's why the speaking in tongues happens in Acts 2. It's got to do with fulfilment of Joel 2 and 3. But most people don't read Joel 2 and 3, even though Peter said that's what it's about. But Peter said, this is the end of the world that Joel was talking about. 
when the judgment of God has now come and the nations that have been oppressive to Israel will be condemned and the Israelites who are away in captivity and no longer speak Hebrew will hear the gospel in their own language and all God's people will be saved at the end because with the coming of the Holy Spirit, God has made him both Christ and Lord, this Jesus whom you crucified. Acts chapter 2 verse 36 is the climax of the great first gospel presentation. God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Here is the gospel, my friends, and it's a strange one for our ears, isn't it? Because we think God was, Jesus was always Christ and Lord, but no, it's by his death and resurrection that God made him Christ and Lord. And so the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is the establishment of the kingdom of Christ, the Lord Jesus. So the resurrection is not a kind of little denouement afterthought. It's the critical part of what the whole gospel is about. The time is fulfilled, Jesus said. The kingdom of God is at hand. Now's the time to repent and believe. For the king has come and he's come to his kingdom by death and resurrection. That is, God the Son has become the Son of God. He was always God the Son. He always is God the Son. But now the man, Jesus, has continued to be the man, Jesus. But now the man, Jesus, is ruling the universe. The resurrection establishes a man in control of everything, namely the Son of God. God the Son, Son of God, two different terms, aren't they? <clears throat> I am a Son of God, but I'm not God the Son. Two different terms. But God the Son became the Son of God in the death and resurrection of Jesus. For that is what the gospel is. The gospel of God is about Jesus by his death and resurrection being made King and Lord, bringing the kingdom of God, the judgment of the world into effect. The gospel promise is forgiveness of sins by his sacrificial death, regeneration by the Holy Spirit as the risen Lord has given it, eternal life won by the resurrection and death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now amnesty, amnesty is a wonderful thing. We had a terrible massacre a few years ago back in the 1990s in the southern part of Tasmania in a, in a place called Port Arthur, which is a dreadful place to start with. But uh, a, a madman went loose and, and shot up 35 people and killed them. It was just, it was a dreadful massacre, the worst ones Australia's had. And our Prime Minister of the day declared almost immediately a gun amnesty. Anybody could bring to any police station in Australia their guns and hand them in, and no one would ask why you had these illegal firearms. No questions. All ownership of private guns, however illegal, totally forgiven. Just turn up and hand them in. We just want to get guns out of our society. And so he declared the amnesty. It was a terrific thing. So you could bring along your three bazookas, your 45 AK-47, whatever it is you had, just bring them in. No one asked why you have a Second World War machine gun in your property. We just, you just bring them in and hand them in, no questions asked. Amnesty. Right? It's a wonderful thing. Libraries give amnesties every now and then, don't they? Because the book you've got, the library fees are 10 times more than the value of the book. Right? It's cheaper to buy a book and give it to the library than to actually pay the fees. So they declare an amnesty. Just bring the book back. We're more interested in getting the book back than we are in getting the fees from you. An amnesty. God has declared an amnesty in the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come home now. Repent now. Forgiveness is available now, but amnesties come to an end. We had, a, I think it was two months to hand in our weaponry in Australia. At the end of that, the fines and the prison sentences for having illegal guns was considerably increased. And there was no excuses after that. If your gun wasn't registered, if it wasn't locked up properly in the right place in a gun company and all the rest of it, there was no excuse. There was no pardon. Condemnation came at the end of the amnesty. God's amnesty is declared in the death and resurrection of Jesus. We are in the age of the amnesty. We are in the age of the resurrection. 
We're in the age of the end of the world. And so the gospel response to the death and resurrection of Jesus is repentance and faith. Jesus said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Here is the fundamental to understand. You see, the way in which God's gospel age has come about is by death and resurrection. And if you want to be in this gospel age of amnesty, death and resurrection is the only way. You too must die. You've got to die with Christ buried with him in baptism in order to be raised with him in the new life of the Holy Spirit. That is the nature of what is being called upon. In Australian vernacular, Jesus says, you want to mean by a disciple, drop dead. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. So entry into this new age is by death the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on your behalf and your response of giving up your life to the Lord Jesus Christ in death. Evangelicals are those who wholly embrace the gospel that has embraced you. The very thing that has grabbed hold of you is what you grab hold of. And once you are in that gospel, then it affects all the rest of your life. The gospel and its truths and its behaviour changes everything that you have. You don't define the gospel by putting a ring around the outside of it. You define the gospel by the very centre of what it's all about and how it's radiated through all of your life and all of the society around about you. For the gospel is the logic of that ring of truth that Jesus Christ is Lord over everything, including you, over creation and over salvation and over every part of my life and being because I've given my life to him and to the gospel. It's spread throughout the world. So the whole of life is now lived completely differently because I'm no longer in this age, I'm in the age of the resurrection the gospel. It's wonderful. Evangelicals are gospel people, wholly embracing the gospel that has embraced us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ, for his death on our behalf and his resurrection. We thank you, Father, for those who have understood your interpretation of this great gospel and who have taught it to us. We thank you for the pouring out of your spirit by your son so that we could be born again and repent and put our faith in the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the forgiveness that he has won for us and the transformation of our lives that we might live for him and for you and for your glory and for his. We thank and praise you, Father, for the privilege of being your children. We thank you, Father, for this overwhelming, wonderful forgiveness that you have given to us. And we do pray, Father, that your spirit would continue to be at work in us, that by your word that is alive and living, by this gospel truth that is there, that our lives will be transformed, that we may ever be giving ourselves more and more to the Lord Jesus Christ, that we may take up our cross and take it up daily to serve you in every way. We thank and praise you, Father, that you have so embraced us, sinful as we are, unworthy as we are, that you by such cost, the death of your Son, should embrace us and give to us new life. We thank and praise you, Father, and pray that by your Spirit we would wholly embrace this gospel message. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.